Hello and welcome to our credit hangout where we're going to talk about what you should know about credit scores. If you'd like to ask a question or uh, like to be involved in this in this uh, credit hangout, all you need to do is tweet out with the credit hangout hashtag or if you're on YouTube, you can click on the, the link at the bottom that says be part of this conversation and you can go in and text your question there. I want to, um, first before we get started, I want to share who is on our panel. Uh, first we have John Olzheimer, who is a nationally recognized expert on credit reporting, credit scoring, and identity theft. He's the president of the Olzheimer Group and credit blogger for Credit Sesame, Mint.com, Credit Card Insider, and the National Foundation for Credit Counseling. Formerly of FICO, Equifax, and Credit.com, John is the only recognized credit expert who actually comes from the credit industry. Uh, Jeannie Kelly is running a little bit behind, but she'll be joining us as well, and she's a nationally recognized authority on credit the founder of the Kelly Group and the author of the 90-Day Credit Challenge. We're also joined here by Rod Griffin, who is the Director of Public Education for Experian. He speaks regularly at regional and national financial literacy events and supports various national consumer education initiatives, including the Life Smarts Consumer Knowledge Competition, for which he serves on the Corporate Advisory Board and the Jumpstart Coalition for Financial Literacy. I also want to welcome Jim Aiken, who is the Senior Manager of Digital Communications at Vantage Score. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. You bet. Thanks for having me. So Thank let's you. get started. Thank you, guys. Um, let's get started with the very first question. Um, Rod, why are our credit scores important? Well, they're not. Why would we worry about credit scores? <laughs> no. Uh, of course, credit scores are, are important, particularly when you're applying for a loan. What I always tell people is if you're talking to the lender, they know what models they're using. They know exactly what they're looking for in terms of risk. So the scores at that point are particularly important in assessing the likelihood that you'll repay a loan. So it's important to understand that. As a consumer, though, I also tell people what's really important is the credit report because the credit report is what provides the information used to do the calculation. So as a consumer, to be empowered to make those scores better, you need to focus on the credit report more than you do, in fact, the number itself. You need to know what from the report's affecting that number. So, of course, scores are important, but it's important equally important to understand the credit report is what's driving that number and you can focus on that to make all of your scores better wherever they might be calculated whatever models used and another thing I, I, and I'll, I'll chime in if, if, if I may um, yes. for consumers I think I think there are so many places that credit scores are used that we just don't we, do, we don't think about them being used I mean everyone knows that when you go to a bank or a credit union or a credit card issuer and you apply for something they're going to go through the process of underwriting and risk assessment. They're going to pull a credit report and a credit score, and that information is going to be used to help them make their decision. We all know that, right? Stipulated. But a lot of consumers don't know that when you apply for homeowners or auto insurance, that the insurance company may look at a credit report and a variation of a credit score called an insurance bureau score, which helps them to determine what type of insurance customer you're going to be. In addition, telecom companies and utility company companies Regularly, regularly pull credit reports and scores so that they can assess the risk of doing business with you. And while public utilities can't deny you based on credit, they can, for example, ask for a deposit. Um, telecom, for example, is another great example. Like your cell phone, you do not have the right to cell phone service despite what you may think. Hmm. So if you've got a poor telecom credit score, you may find yourself having a more difficult time getting an account with one of the, you know, the national telecom companies. So it's it's considerably more than just um, a bank that is getting access to the credit report and credit score information. I'd like to, yeah, just to add to that, I, I, I second all of what I what everyone has said. Um, it's also important to remember that uh, lenders also use your credit score to set the rates that they charge you and the fees that they assign you and so on. So um, having a high score or as high a score as you can can save you a lot of money over the long haul over the terms of a loan or the life of a credit card. Great. And I want to welcome Jeannie. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad you can get online. <laughs> Thank you. I know I'm traveling and I thought this computer would um, <laughs> let me log on, so of course I'm holding my iPhone right now. <laughs> but it's working. That's working great. That's awesome. Uh, Janie, what do you share with your clients um, that come to you and ask you, like, how important are credit scores? Right. Well, I do think, 
your credit score is as important as knowing what my cholesterol number is or what my SAT score was at one time. You know, credit scores are so important for your financial future, you know, of how much money, uh, like everyone was just saying, maybe the interest rate would be on the loan. And so it's important to try to keep your credit score as healthy as possible. Yeah. You and interesting, Mike, I, I'm not prone to embellishment, but I would suggest that having a good credit score is not unlike picking the right mutual fund or picking the right stock. It is a wealth building tool. If I can go through my 30 or 40 years of borrowing money, paying lower interest rates because I've got a good score, that's money every single month that I'm not giving to a lender that so I can true. be to fund my son's college or stick into an IRA or, or invest in something that I may want to invest in. And we spend so much time working and earning a living and trying to build wealth so that someday we can, you know, hang up our spurs and go bass fishing. And one of the ways that you build wealth is not to spend more money than you're already going to have to. That's right. right. Yeah. Isn't it funny when people, John and everybody, don't even, they're saying, I'm trying to save and trying to do so much, but they don't even know what their credit report or score looks like, you know? So, yeah, yeah that's yeah, key. That's so true. Um, I'm going to add one more thing that John and I talk about a lot, and that is where credit scores are not used. And one of the myths that we deal with all the time, employers never get credit scores. So Wait a minute. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read that on a blog somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so we clear that point, and I don't have to say anything the rest of the afternoon, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> That comes up all the time, Rod. Oh, I know. I know. Yep. Oh, man. Um, thank you. Uh, let's go to the second question. Um, John, how are credit scores calculated, and what are some of the most important factors we should be thinking about? Sure, sure. So I think people try to make credit scoring more confusing and complicated than it actually needs to be. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, credit scoring systems, FICO, Vantage Score, these companies have been criticized for many years by consumers for being um, opaque. And I would suggest the exact opposite is true, that these companies have done a very good job of being very transparent and clearly disclosing not only how they calculate a score, but what factors go into their scores and how important those factors are. And so think of a, a credit scoring model as being kind of like a filter. And what you're doing is you're filtering all this credit data through it, and the model is essentially assigning points or value to how well you perform in certain categories. So whether or not you're making your payments on time, or the presence or lack thereof of derogatory information, um, how you're using debt, what type of debt you have, um, how much debt you have relative to your credit limits and loan amounts, very important. How often you're shopping for credit. Are you constantly out there opening new accounts? Or are you more conservative with your credit shopping activities? How old is your credit report? Not how old are you, how mm. old is your credit report? Is your credit mm. report older or is your credit report younger? And then finally is, do you have a nice diverse set of accounts on your credit report or are you someone who only uses credit cards or only um, has had an auto loan? These are all the, the, the components or the recipe, if you will, that go into your score, and as long as you're performing well on all these little components, then it's really not that difficult to earn really good scores and to maintain them. When, when someone comes to you, John, and says, um, "What?" and asks you, like, okay, what is the main thing I can work on to help improve my score, make it look better? What, okay. what can I do? Oh, uh, well, uh, so it, it's funny because the... I think a lot of people expect my answer to be to pay your bills on time, but either you have done that or you have not done that. I mean, that mm. ship has already sailed. And if you've got derogatory information on your credit report, you know, that's a seven to ten year problem because mm. the Fair Credit Reporting Act allows companies like Experian and the other reporting agencies to maintain that information for a very long time. So you can't just snap your fingers and all of a sudden that stuff is gone. It's not very actionable. The, the, the actionable answer is, is really the credit card debt. It is, mm -hmm. it is so impactful to your scores, you just have no idea. And as long as you can get that balance down, you don't have to pay it off, but as long as you can work month to month to reduce that balance relative to the credit limits as much as you possibly can, eliminate credit cards with balances, that's a very actionable way to improve your credit scores a lot 
very quickly, and that is an ethical strategy to make your scores higher. I, I like that you mentioned about credit card debt. What what are the how low should we get that percentage down to? So so it's going to it, it, the, the optimal answer is zero because if you have no credit card debt, then you are not paying interest and credit card interest in, an, in average or on average is about 15%. So it's generally going to be the most expensive debt that we service unless you're frequenting payday lenders. And if you are, then you're on the wrong teleconference. Um, <laughs> what, what you'd like to do is you'd like to strive to keep that percentage as low as possible. Um, FICO publishes some data that 7% is the target. Vantage mm. Core publishes that if you're below 30%, you're in good shape. I always default to the as low as possible answer because you know all these scores are out there in circulation being used by lenders, and if you sit there and try to chase around, well, what should I do to make this score good versus what should I do to make that score good, you can kind of piggyback off what Rod said earlier is it's easier to manage three credit reports than it is to manage 300 credit scores. Mm. So I always suggest just pay the credit card balances down as low as you can. Don't get you know focused on a number or a percentage because then you're really hurting cats at that point. If you can get it to zero, awesome. If you can't, work to get it there. That's great. I just wanted to put in a little plug for uh, at, over at yourvantagescore.com. We have a, a cool infographic that kind of shows, at least with respect to Vantage Score 3 um, the, the various factors that affect your score. And it, it also gives some, some indication of how long certain derogatory events in your credit file take to sort of wear off or see their, um, to see their uh, effects diminish. So uh, just it, various events, uh, you know, even though there is some stuff will stay on your, on your report for, um, you know, seven to ten years, not all of them have the full weight of their negative effect last that long. Some of them kind of taper off more quickly and you can sort of act on a, to uh, correct against those quicker. I was going to ask also the panel, what are some of the most offending things in your credit report that you that are that are really really hurting the scores aside from from credit card debt? Well I mean the the fastest way to turn Vantage score 810 to Vantage score 510 is to Pot is for negative information to hit your report. And, and I mean, this is like the list of seven deadlies, and it can be anything from severe, severely delinquent accounts that are not in default to accounts that have kind of crossed that imaginary line and have gone into default and is, have either been charged off by the credit issuer, sent to collections by the credit issuer, settlements you may, may have made with your credit issuers, um, third party collections that have hit the mm. credit report, or public records. And in the world of credit reporting, there are no good public records. They're all bad, bankruptcies, judgments, and tax liens. So if you, if, you are, um, if you are able to avoid those types of incidents, then it really makes you know, managing your scores a whole heck of a lot easier because at that point, it's just a matter of how low can you get your credit card debt. But also, I just would like to add that if someone – has had negative reporting in the past, they can start by stopping that bad habit, paying attention to their credit, and saying, I'm not going to keep repeating those bad, you know, not paying on time and going over the 30-day due date. I'm going to start today to focus on mm -hmm. paying attention. So in time, obviously, like John said, those things will stay on the credit report for years, but at least if they can stop the bad habit, they are rebuilding back healthy credit by not keep adding the, you know, more yes. problems and more problems. Yes. Um, and I'd add just uh, one more thing. There, I agree completely with, it, with what everyone said. Well, I'm often asked by people a couple of things. One, what's the ideal number of credit cards to have or what's the perfect balance? And the answer in credit reporting and credit scoring for everyone is it depends on your unique history. So what I think of as gaming the system, trying to have the perfect number of cards or the perfect number of, you know, perfect utilization rate never works because it, there is no universal number. It depends on your unique credit history, the mix of credit you have, how are you using the credit you have? So, you know, like John said, we default to the lower of the balance, the better, not 
X percent because every time I've done that, I've been wrong. The person will say, well, I'm lower than that and my score is bad. Well, what else is there that you didn't tell me about? You know, that's, that's the issue. You know, there's no perfect mix. It's just two things. Pay your bills on time. Keep your balances low. And everything and every score builds on those two things. Hmm. So it's, it's habit over time. No real secret. I want to go to the next question. Uh, Jeannie, what is the difference between educational credit scores and lender scores, and, and how are they different? Right. Well, basically, with educational scores, it's still not a bad idea to be using them, but know that you're the one looking at it. The lenders aren't looking at those scores to loan you money or to decide what interest rate or the terms of the loan. You know, but they still can be a very good tool because you can be learning, you know, what what's making my score go up, go down. And again, it would be the derogatory information or the balances or opening so many credit cards at one time. But um, the FICO scoring is used by 90% of lenders. And of course, Vantage score is used by many lenders. So, you know, those are the scores that I feel you should be paying more attention to because those are the ones that when you're applying for funding, that's what the banks are looking at. Mm -hmm. So that's what, you know, I would suggest following. Thanks, Jeannie. Uh, and for those that maybe not have never heard about educational credit scores versus lender scores, can you kind of talk about, like, what, what's the difference? Because some people might be scratching their head going, what, I don't understand the difference between those two. Well, they're just calculated differently, you know. So the Vantage score, and you're on the you're on the line. You can talk about your scoring. You know, yeah. it it still basically is saying the same things. So they're always going to be talking about how you're paying your bills, how you're keeping your balances. It's just that the educational are more for you, you learning it mm -hmm. on your own, but no one else is looking at it. You know, again, is is that a bad thing? No. Here's, yeah. how I, here's how I differentiate between the, the educational score and the quote-unquote lender score. Is, and, 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 and I'll be the first to admit that my attitude has changed over time with respect to, to these two types. And it, I define them as this. So an educational score is a score that's not commercially available to a lender. So it's impossible for a lender to see that score and make a decision. Versus a lender score, which is one of the many score brands, that are commercially available and lenders have access to them. Um, not to get all super technical, but in order for a lender to use a credit score in this country, it has to meet very rigid requirements under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. You can't just have a couple guys go and build a credit score model during lunch and then have Bank of America. <laughs> it has to be empirically derived and statistically and demonstrably sound, and that takes a long time and a lot of skilled people in order to build a score to do that. It does not take that to build an educational score. So that's, in my mind, what I see is the difference between educational versus lender. There are a ton especially today in 2014, there are a lot of scores that are being either given away to consumers or sold to consumers online that are also commercially available to lenders. FICO, Vantage, uh, the TransUnion Risk Score, the Experian National Risk Model. These are all scores that people are calling you know, credit scores, but they may try to kind of pigeonhole them into either this educational versus not educational, you know, compartment. And in my mind, they're all real scores because they're all built with that ECOA standard. And B, they're actually commercially available and used by lenders. The educational score, I, you know, I like the fact that they're out there because they give the consumer kind of an introduction into credit scoring. What's considered, how important are things, and directionally speaking, regardless of whether it's a lender score or an educational score, if you've got a good credit report, you're going to have a good score regardless of what model. If you've got a lousy credit report, you're going to have a lousy score regardless of what model. So regardless of whether they nail your number specifically, mm -hmm. which is impossible, um, it at least gives you kind of a directional understanding of how good or how bad your credit happens to be at that point in time. And I would, I'll, and I'll give a third perspective on the definition. My definition of educational versus a lender score is that any score from any source that a person gets online outside of the lending situation is educational. You cannot purchase a score from anyone online, walk into your lender with it, and say, give me a loan. 
Mm. The reason you got that score is to understand where your your challenges are, what your issues are with your credit history so that you can begin to take action to improve that credit history. So it's educational in that sense. And that's why I always tell people, I focus less on the scores and I purchase my scores from those sites periodically and, I'll, and I share them, I'm happy to. The numbers are always very different. The thing that's really important is that the factors from those scores are very consistent. They tell you what you need to focus on. The numbers can be very different from scores the factors tend to be consistent. If you focus on those factors, again, from the credit report, you can make all of your scores better. And that's the lesson that I want everybody to take away is don't get so hung up on one number from one source that you can't improve your credit history, that you can't take action. And I think that's that's very important. But if, in my view, if you didn't get that score from your lender, it's educational. It's meant to help you understand. And that doesn't make them bad. Uh, a study by the FTC or CFPB, now I can't remember which one, Recently, as FTC found that there was an 80% correlation in terms of what the score, so-called educational scores, represented, or more, 85 to 90%, as compared to the scores lenders got. So they're very, very closely correlated, uh, and you can use those scores to help you become more creditworthy. I think that's that's the important thing to understand. Yeah, we yeah. we consider ourselves a vantage score. We consider ourselves a lender score, um, but. We're available for free from a number of uh, various websites where you can obtain your your score and get it updated every month and keep an eye on on how things are going and kind of uh, track your behavior and uh, I just feel like with, with that option available to you, you know the ability to access a lender score a score that lenders actually use from a, from another source. Why not do it? If it's if it's free, so um, and you can find out where. The, I don't want to turn it into a commercial, but you. you I'll, I'll tell them. <laughs> you can get your Vantage score from Credit Karma. You can get your Vantage score from Credit.com, and you can now get your Vantage score score from Quizzle. And and I write about this, so I this is important to me as a as a credit quasi yeah. journalist. But the good thing about this is. Is you've also covered all your credit report bases too, because the Vantage score from Quizzle is based on Equifax data, the Vantage score from Credit.com is based on Experian data, and the Vantage score from Credit.com mm. is based on TransUnion data. So you really don't have an excuse anymore. <laughs> I don't know what my credit report quality is, and I don't know what my credit score quality is. You're just not looking, you're not paying attention if you're making that statement. Thanks That's for doing good. that commercial for me, John. <laughs> um, I want to dig in a little bit more on on Vantage score. Uh, what is, uh, Jim, what is different or unique about the Vantage Score credit scoring model? Well, we like to say that, um, you know, we, we kind of have a, a three-legged stool that, that's our value proposition. We, we, we consider ourselves more accurate, more consistent, and we score more people. And I think from a consumer standpoint, the most uh, intriguing of those three is the, the scores more people uh, story. We the, the design of our model is such that we're able to um, provide accurate scores for about 30 to 35 million more people than traditional credit scores do, and that's just because of the, the way the model is designed. We're able to uh, capture information on folks who are new entrants to the credit market, or who are um, in many cases are uh, experienced credit users, but they are just not using their credit quite as often as they used to. Maybe they're retired or maybe they're uh, just in the wake of the recession, we saw a lot of changes uh, to, to the behavior where folks are just kind of tapering back from, from their use of credit a little bit. And uh, so folks are kind of falling off the radar on, in, in terms of some scores, but we're able to continue to develop scores for them. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, another question for the panel, and I'll, and I'll ask Rod this first. Um, how often should we be checking our credit scores, and what scores should we be checking? <laughs> uh, I think first you should, at the minimum, check your credit scores when you check your credit report each month. So when you get a free report, purchase a score at, at a minimum. Uh, if you're planning to apply for credit, Always check your reports and scores, I would say, at least three to six months in advance and know what's there so that you're not surprised by anything. Um, you know, so, it, so from there, it depends on the individual. To me, if, 
if you're the kind of person who's concerned about the scores and the reports and you subscribe to a monitoring service uh, or a, a credit report service, check it as much as you like, but at a minimum at least once a year, if not, and then prior to applying for credit. That, that's where I would start. Uh, in terms of what score, uh, I would say the Vantage score. Uh, to, to start, if you get your free credit report from Experian, you can purchase a Vantage score as well, and John pointed out several of the places you can get it, but um, and there are other scores available as well. Uh, so um, but start with Vantage score and Experian. I, I have nothing to add there. <laughs> no, there, 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 there are so many. There are so many places to get a free score. Yeah. And, and yeah. Kind of a free summary of your report. I mean, I, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't also include Credit Sesame in that discussion yeah. because the way yes. um, Experian based Experian National Risk Score, which is, again is a commercially available score. So let's add them to the discussion if we're talking about free stuff. Mm -hmm. And most of these websites will update the score proactively at no cost, and when I say at no cost, I really mean at no cost, once a month. And so, you know, if, if you're a junkie like me, then you can look at multiple scores once a month. <laughs> or if you're more casually engaged, then you can look at it once a quarter, or once every six months, once a year. So the, you have so many options now to get access to the information at no cost that there's, it's really... It's really a matter of just how often you want to see it, as to how often versus how often I think you should see it. I, I like mm -hmm. seeing it once a month. It's it, 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 it's enjoyable for me to see that I've got a damn good score every single month. <laughs> That's and nice. For me, I think it's something that we should be much more engaged in. I love that. I love that. Uh, Jeannie, how how do you uh, advise your clients? Um, how often should they be checking their scores? I, I say at least twice a year, you know, and again, though, if they're going to be purchasing something like obviously a home or uh, doing a refinance, yeah. you want to look at it three months before because if there is something that um, is inaccurate on the report, they have time to fix it. Or if they say, okay, I think my balances are a little too high, you know, let me lower them. You know, it kind of gives them a reality check. If yeah. they do it three months before. But of course they want to do it at least twice a year because the faster you see a problem, then the easier to fix it. You know, you don't want to be not paying attention to your credit and then all of a sudden you didn't look at it for three years until you need it. And then, you know, you're finding all this inaccurate information and it may take you time to fix it. So definitely twice a year is my rule of thumb. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah. The uh, the other uh, question that we have here, uh, this one is for John. What's more important, a consumer's credit report or their credit score? And, and just a reminder for those that are watching, the credit score is not part of the credit report. That's right. It's it, that people use the terms interchangeably as if they're the same thing, which is where a lot of these myths come from. Is they use one phrase when you really actually mean another another one. Um, you know, it's. In my mind, they're, they're, obviously they're both very important. Um, the score is a litmus test that lenders can look at very quickly without having to page through a lot of credit report uh, pages, especially for people who've had credit for a long time, and it gives them a, a quick indication of whether or not this person is going to be qualified to, to do anything. Um, having said that, I think we've made it evidently clear that you have so many scores that trying to manage them and track them down and is, is, first off, it's impossible because the vast majority of the scores that are used by lenders are not even available to consumers in any environment. Um, but you only have three credit reports. So in my mind, the credit report is more important only because it's readily accessible to consumers. And if you're managing the data on that report and making it speak glowingly of you, then every single credit score is going to take care of itself because they're all based on those three reports. So for me, it's more it's uh, it's it's more efficient to do it that way. It's easier, um, and you're not driving yourself batty trying to chase down all these these different credit scores, which you're not going to be able to get anyways. Mm. Yeah. And John, for for those that want to get their credit report, where should they be going? There's a few places. Um, you have the the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is a federal statute enacted in 1970, and it defines a variety of things vis-a-vis -vis consumer rights with regards to credit reports. One of the things that that federal statute now provides is that every single person who's watching this, as long as they're in the United States, has the right to see all of their 
consumer reports. Now that includes credit reports, but it also includes a whole lot more than just credit reports. But mm. if we're talking about credit reports, you have the right to see all of your credit reports once every 12 months at no cost, and you can claim them at annualcreditreport.com. And, and I'd like for people to listen to that domain again and write it down and make sure they get it right, because there's a lot of squatter sites. They'll actually build websites with you know, conscious misspellings of some of these words in a way to kind of get you into a, a, a fee-based product. But annualcreditreport.com is one place where you can go and claim them. You can go to all three of the credit reporting agencies' websites, Experian.com, TransUnion.com, Equifax.com, and they've got a plethora of products and services that will include access to your credit reports as well. So again, if, if once, a, once every 12 months is not enough for you, you have options. Um, and you can choose to, to take advantage of those options. Um, so it, again, it's it, there should be no secrets about where you can claim credit reports or how you get credit reports. There's so many places where they're available. Um, you, 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 it's, it's really a, the, it's a buyer's market, frankly. Thanks, John. I'd just like to put in a plug for uh, once again, you know, for annualcreditreport.com, but also uh, a great website that we. Uh, Support just you know kind of on, on the fringes, but it's, it's not a, a branded website at all. It's called CreditScoreQuiz.org, and it's got a lot of great information about. It's it's an interactive quiz, and you take the quiz, and then you see your you, which answers you got right and wrong, and it shows you the right answers for all the questions. So, um, it, it, in doing that, it conveys a ton of great information about. Um, Good credit habits, um, use how to check your reports, all that stuff. So um, I highly recommend it, and it's it's, um, it's free and it's fun, and it's it's creditscorequiz.org. Thank you, and I, I just want to show uh, John Olsheimer referenced annualcreditreport.com. Um, just want to show everyone a, a screenshot of what that website looks like. Um, I'll also provide a link to annualcreditreport.com in the description of this YouTube video for those that are watching um, later on I'll add a link there so John thanks for sharing um, that resource can you can you refresh or scroll down or take yeah take <laughs> 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 there we are okay <laughs> <laughs> there we go it's also important when you do get your credit report and you know when you are taking the time to pull it and look at it from the three credit bureaus, you want to make sure all the information on there is correct. Like mm -hmm. really take a look at it and you know get out your highlighter and anything that's wrong. You know, a lot of times they may have a middle initial that doesn't belong to you mm. or an address that doesn't belong to you besides the credit history. You know, you want to look at everything and just make sure everything's correct. And if not, you have the copy of the report right there and you can call. You know, if it's experienced, you know, you can definitely dispute the information that's wrong and make sure it gets correct and that it's accurate. What's the what's the process, um, Gene? I'm glad you mentioned, um, you know, seeing a mistake or an error in the credit report. It could be something very small, like a like a name, um, right? A middle name. Uh, what is the process to dispute something in your credit report? Well, so you can do it, uh, you know, you can definitely do it online or you can pick up the phone, you know, or you can do it the old-fashioned way and mail it, you know, mail it in. But it's very easy to deal and, you know, call Experian or do it online and just say, this is, that is not my correct name or this account does not belong to me. I don't know why it's on my credit report or, um you know, if there's something that you see, no matter what it is, it could be a phone number that didn't belong to you. Whatever it is, you just ask them to verify it because it's not correct. Obviously, your name, it's very easy to send them your proof of ID so they can see how to correct your name. But, um, you know, they'll work directly with you, and it's very simple. I, I want to jump in just a, uh, just a second on you know, sort of the examples of, of inaccuracies. Um, and we talk about a lot ident about identifying information in terms of being wrong. And in fact, it's not. I mean, that, that's one of the, when you see studies about the percentage of errors in a report, the most famous one 
the majority of what they were citing as errors were name variations or address variations. B, you know, I want it to be to be very clear that 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 information is representative of what's being reported to us by lenders. So it's not an error in most cases. You know that it, instead it's a representation, accurate representation of what's being reported by your lenders is belonging to us, and the reason that's important is that it could indicate fraud. And if you see, so we will list every variation of your social security number, every variation of the name that's of your name that's sent to us, any nicknames. I always use my dad as the perfect example. He, he has multiple names on his report because he can't decide what he wants to be called. And he has <laughs> oh my different names. So. And I've worked for experience 17 years, and he gets his report once a year, and we have the same conversation. I tell him, Dad, decide what your name is, and we'll have one name. Um, but, you know, I always try to stress that, you know, you can dispute that information. We'll go back to the lender make sure it's correct, but also recognize that it's not really an error. It's a representation of what's accurate representation of what's reported to us so that you can recognize that as potential fraud and take action on it as well. Um, you know, we don't have a access to Social Security Administration records, for example, so we're matching to and showing what your lender reports as your Social Security number. And we'll list variations because we want to make sure you see all of those things. So, uh, you know, there that's a common sort of misrepresentation as an error when in fact it's not. But um, Jeannie, I agree completely. If you see something you don't recognize, something that doesn't belong to you, absolutely contact us, dispute it, because we want to make sure that it's accurate and complete. And for those that are watching, if you're interested in disputing something uh, with Experian, you can go to experian.com slash disputes. Uh, that's disputes plural. And um, again, I'll put that link in the about section of this YouTube video after this chat um, so you guys can see that. It's just an online app that you can use. Um, the last question that we have here, what are the most common myths that you hear about credit scores? And, and Jeannie, I'll start this one with you. <laughs> well, I think we talked about a lot of them during this, you know. Yes. Um, and the one that Rod brought up, you know, is probably the one that I've been hearing the most about the employers mm -hmm. getting your credit yeah. scores. And I think a lot of that is because some people still think a credit report is a credit score. So I think that's kind of why they people are confused with that. Um, so that's the myth, you know, and that also that your age is part of your credit score, people think, you know, that's one, you know, and obviously, you know, these are all things, um, your income, I hear people think is part of the credit score. Um, and also they think that there's just one credit score. They don't realize, you know, so I think those are the ones that I'm mostly hearing about. Mm. Uh, wh what about the rest of you? One of the misses, I have to have a lot of cards to have a good credit score, and you don't, you know, one or two with a history. It's not about how much credit you have, it's about how you manage the credit you do have. And so if you use your credit wisely, whether it's two cards or ten, that's what's going to be important. Not that you have ten credit cards. Not that you have two. You know, it's it's the way you manage credit you have over time that's really important. Yeah, I was going to share with John that one of the myths that I kind of grew up hearing was that by pulling your credit report, checking your credit report, it would hurt your score. And oh, yeah, I and I thought that was true for a very long time until coming to Experian. I, I just thought that oh, I want to be really careful. I don't want to check my report too many times. Yeah. That is another really good one. Everyone thinks that they don't, and I'm always trying to say it's healthy to be checking your credit, you know, so it's just for them understanding, for them pulling it and looking at it compared to a lender pulling it as a hard inquiry. Yes, thank you. Um, really go ahead, Rob. Kind of related to that, when one thing that uh, is built into all the uh, major lender scores is uh, accommodation for for rate shopping, so that there it's true that it, when when you when a lender pulls your score, there is a, a an impact on your credit score briefly. But um, at least with Vantage Score, it's a it's sort of a rolling two week window that, uh, that during which you can um, apply for similar loans with other lenders and you know compare the rates and terms that they give you. And you're not penalized further for that. It's all treated as one event. 
for a good interview. Well, I want to I, I want to um, thank you all for being part of this credit hangout. Uh, Jeannie Kelly, thank you for hanging out with us, and uh, I'm glad you could get on with your iPhone. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Jim, over at Vantage. <laughs> That's commitment right there. Yeah, totally. And, and Jim, thank you so much. And, and John Olsheimer, as always, thank you for hanging out with us yeah. and sharing your insights with us. And, and Rod Griffin, thank you so much. I want to remind everyone who's watching, if you're interested in, in other future Credit Hangouts, you can always go to the URL you see on your screen, bit.ly slash credit dash hangout. That'll bring you over to our Experian blog uh, where you can see upcoming credit events where we're talking about credit, credit reports, credit scores, and other personal finance topics.